It's time for the Daily Stand-Up Podcast presented by Agile Dad with your host, Lee Henson. Without any further ado, let's get started. All right, I'm going to try to do something that I've never done before. I had a request to review an article that was written by Srivanas Sarapalli. I hope I didn't butcher the name. It was published here in February of 2022, so it's a relatively new article. And it talks about eight agile estimating methods, at least that's what it's titled. And uh, I'm going to change the title of this just a little bit. And uh, this might tell you the slant of where I'm going with this. I'm going to call it eight agile estimating methods and why none of the eight work. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Here we go. So uh, let's get ready to rumble. Uh, So eight estimation methods. So he starts off the post talking about uh, that estimation methods are concerned with determining the amount of time and effort that are needed to accomplish an item in a prioritized backlog to get better planning for your sprints. That that makes sense. You're forecasting, right? Uh, He continues uh, that there are multiple strategies to be able to do this. And as part of the daily grind, projections include anything from cost estimates to delivery time estimates. But, uh, you know, if you don't have the right things in line, none of this is going to work. But instead of winging it, uh, they put some thought into some estimating approaches and how they might work. So far, so good. We all need to have a baseline. We all need to start somewhere. And uh, he starts with these approaches. Okay. So uh, I guess before you start doing anything, you need to define what agile estimation is. So it's just a way for us to figure out and be predictable. That's what it boils down to, right? So uh, it's it's figuring out what fits in a small sprint cycle. It's figuring out what's going to work best for your organization. Uh, it's, it's making sure you understand the purpose, that the purpose of doing estimates are to hold a team accountable for their deliveries, to uh, make the Agile group more disciplined, to estimate the time needed to complete a project. Oh, boy, here we go. Uh, and I think instead of time, what's meant here is to estimate or to predict a date of completion. Now, this is interesting because most projects I've ever worked on, they they don't, they already have a date pre-baked. They want something by X date. And, uh, you know, you can try all your heart out to say, I'm going to be late or I'm going to come in early or whatever the case may be, but they still have an expectation that you're going to deliver by a certain date. And then, of course, uh, he says, uh, increasing the efficiency of the group. I, I love it. So I, I think overall so far, I'm impressed with the article. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about why do teams estimate? Well, th- this is this is kind of Captain Obvious, but it's okay. I'll run with it. So it improves the ability for everyone to make decisions. Because if we have an estimation, we know we can forecast and make good choices. Like it. Improve cohesion. It makes sure that everyone's on the same page. When you're working in short cycles, it's important to have everyone all beating to the same drum. I get it. We're marching to the beat of the same drum. I'm good with that. Improve control of risks because it helps you identify and manage risks when you are doing this correctly. I can do that. And then I love that he goes on to talk about the discovery phase. Uh, It's not very often I see another coach or trainer who talks about the initiation or the discovery phase of figuring out what we need to do. Most people jump straight into the work and say, but we're agile. We can figure it out as we go. And it is important for us to have a short phase, at least initially, where we do some of that ideation and discovery of our MVP. And I think that uh, that's going to help us to be more powerful. And of course, the method to get there are all the things that you learn in a typical certified Scrum product owner course. Uh, Stakeholder interviews, conducting stakeholder interviews to figure out exactly what their needs are. Uh, Determining the product backlog at the highest level. So starting out with a BAFATA, and he specifically calls out a technical architect and a business analyst, which I love. The only one he's missing was the functional analyst representing strategic. But you get those people together to determine a product backlog at a high level. So he's on to something here. Get to know your clients and potential customers better by creating personas that emulate who they are and doing some empathy mapping. Set requirements and order of importance. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a second. If you ask somebody what's most important, you know, I have these five things, which is the most important? The answer is going to be all of them are important. So you can't have all number ones, right? So I think that it's it's a misnomer whenever you ask people to do things in order of importance. When was the last time somebody came to you and said, I have these really unimportant things I need you to work on? That never happens, right? So I think the thing here is a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, um, if if I have all these things that are important, then they're all high priority. Well, priority doesn't tie to importance. Priority ties to urgency. 
And I think that if you ask which of these important things are the most urgent, you're going to get a different answer because that's a more vetted, well-valued question, right? So um, he goes on to describe Moscow. And he talks about must have, should have, could have, and he uses will not have. And that's originally how it was set up. So Mike Cohn set it up that way. But what I can say is this, uh, for will not have, it says this is irrelevant, lose it, not only for now, but for good. And it's good for you to identify those things so you can get rid of them, but it makes the W very short-lived in Moscow. So for me, I say the W should be highlighted for would like and make it those those whiz-bang, cool, pleaser, Kino model things that you want to do. And uh, don't use the W for will not have. Instead, just eliminate the things you won't have and move on, right? Because uh, then you can repurpose that W for something that's going to be even more valuable. Okay. So he goes on to describe, uh, it looks like the import or the MVP backlog should be prepared now at this step. Okay. And he's talking about the Bafata working together to prepare an MVP backlog. Got it. We should estimate the project costs and timelines. Now, this is interesting. For a number of years, I thought I was the only person on the planet who said that there should be some preliminary estimation of project cost and timeline. And I just quickly learned that there's someone else who agrees with me. Now, he goes on to talk about estimating at the MVP. This is starting to feel a little safe to me. Uh, safe as in scaled agile. But it, it, it's interesting because I think you can get some value out of this if it's done correctly. The problem is most people don't do this correctly. So uh, we need to be careful with estimation at this point, right? And then he talks about using Agile story point estimation to its fullest potential. And he gives you a set of bullet points. So he says, with story points, the estimation process is as follows. I don't know if it could be any more dogmatic. Here we go. Identify user stories. Discuss story point requirements, questions, and answer sessions. Uh, our product owner and a business analyst job, depending on which role they fill. Estimates can be made creating a matrix each item of work is rated numerically according to an estimation matrix using Fibonacci, 1, 3, 5, 8, 13, et cetera, or linear, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Scales can be used for this. Using Fibonacci is preferred by many teams because there are larger gaps between the numbers. It makes it easier to see how values assigned differ based on different job roles. Okay, <laughs> let's stop there. So... Here, we're doing individual Fibonacci estimates based on ability as opposed to overarching Fibonacci estimates. And it still ties back to time at some point here, which is really, really interesting to me. Um, I just see a lot that's not right here. And, and it's, not, it's not so much I'm trying to ding it. It's just you have to really be, when you start talking about estimation, this has to be crisp. And I'm not saying it has to be dogmatic. But I think that this is not a pragmatic approach, right? I think we do need to get everyone on the same page and we do need to all move in the same direction when it comes to story point estimates. But I think we need to find a way to separate time from, from what we're doing so that we can get the greatest value out of this. And then he goes on to talk about sprint velocity estimation, which ties back to story points again. And he starts out with planning poker. Now, I don't know about you, but I've played planning poker a number of times. And what I can tell you is uh, every time I play planning poker, I've liked it less and less and less. Yes, it affords valuable conversation, but it just takes so long. I've seen sessions that take three hours to get through 10 backlog items. I mean, it's just, it, it's it's too much. And even if you try to time box it, then you still don't get enough information because of the way you're conducting planning poker to make a valid decision. So teams make a decision just to get it over with. But oftentimes you'll find that those decisions are haphazard or they're doing it based on time and you know, a point equals a day or whatever the case may be. And, and they're tying it back to time. So you're still getting time-based estimates, which are inherently wrong. So as much as I love my cone and as much as I love using a Fibonacci sequence, I still think planning poker is very difficult. Do I still think you need to have those grooming backlog refinement conversations? Absolutely. But do I think you should be doing this at sprint planning or having a planning poker meeting? Absolutely not. I think we need to get back to uh, figuring things out without having to do that. He goes on to talk about use of analogies. So uh, saying, you know, this story is similar to this story. Uh, so anal analogories or uh, with other story lengths are used to estimate 
current story lengths. When generating assumptions, it's important estimation to use this technique for relative sizing. Okay, so I, I get what he's trying to do here. It's just, it's hard. He's basically saying if this one was a two and this one's similar, then this one should be a two. I, I get that and that's fine. It's just, it doesn't always boil down that way. So this is probably the closest to being correct, but still not because one to two, always a two, isn't a good way to go about things. Sometimes something's a two because we had a lot of pre-work done where next time the same exact thing could be a 10 because we didn't have that pre-work done. So it's just important for you to figure out where you are, yes? Okay, so then the next one is calculate an actual t-shirt size. And uh, this is interesting. So you put the t-shirt sizes on the wall, which I'm a big proponent of, and I don't care if you use t-shirt sizes, dog sizes, mountain sizes, whatever it is. But then where it gets interesting is uh, they say based on the t-shirt size, now you need to perform rough estimates for how long it's going to take you to do these things and then drop those into the t-shirt size categories. Okay, once again, not a fan. If we just went straight t-shirt sizing, we'd be good. But I think the second you try to tie it back to time, it makes it hard. Also, there's not a real good plan for, even if you went straight t-shirt size, which is another option it says here. T-shirt size is the winner, by the way. It's just doing it this way with this performance isn't going to work because we don't have a benchmark. So we didn't take the time to set a benchmark for small. We're not doing rapid estimation techniques. There, there are things that are missing that are gonna cause us to talk about things ad nauseum and talk about other things not at all. And it's just gonna make it really hard for us to get our head around the work that needs to be done. So for me, this version of t-shirt doesn't work. There's also dot voting. Everybody gets a series of dots, put the dots on the cards, the ones with the most dots. You know, they, they fall in that order. That's great until you have a dependency or that's great until someone doesn't understand something. And it's great until you're relying on someone else, at which point you have to pivot. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, each one of these has its own merit in some way, but each one of these also has its downfall if it's not done exclusively correctly. And I want to make sure I'm emphasizing also that I'm not trying to say be completely dogmatic. It's okay to have a pragmatic approach as long as your pragmatic approach yields positive results. Yes. Okay. So uh, next, he talks about mapping affinity relationships. Now, this is interesting because I use this technique coupled with other techniques to make things work. So um, this is a quiet measurement of size initially, making edits on a wall, and making sure you place things correctly in where they need to be, and uh, moving and adjusting as you need to, and then having the product owner chime in. So, so there's lots of good things here. So this is a systematically good thing. The problem is the way that it's laid out here is too time consuming. So once again, it's a matter of taking those things and speeding them up to the point where teams can make effective decisions uh, without falling prey to everything else going on. The next one is estimating using a bucket system. This is where you have all the different buckets. They usually follow the Fibonacci size and you're bucketing things together. Once again, another good method, but still just very, very hard to do once things get too big. Uh, there's something called the method of three points, which is... Uh, if everything goes according to plan, how how much time will it take to do this? If how much time will it take if things go wrong? You know those kind of things, and then of course, how much time is taken for a favorable outcome, right? And you can measure all this and get it all done. And then of course, there's the Fibonacci sequencing, which we briefly talked about, using that for story point estimation and tying it back to some value. And I think that no matter which of these techniques you choose, what's going to happen is you're going to quickly discover that rapid release planning is better. And it's not a shameless plug for what I do. It's just a plug for saying, hey, there is a right way and a wrong way to do this. And it's time, it's high time for us to figure out that there's better ways to do estimation. So once again, not trying to diss the article. I just think that it wasn't, it's inconclusive. It didn't give me the information that I needed in order to make a good decision. So that's going to do it for today. It's a longer episode, but uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about each one of those with you. So if you have another topic you want us to cover, make sure you reach out to us at learnmoreatagiledad.com. We'd love to talk about yours. Stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care.